right, so what is money? You take a look. Historically, we've had different kinds of money. Sometimes the money was red. I don't know if I have blue money here. You have all these different kinds of money. We agree that this is money. But what if we just say, this isn't really money? All those fat cats on Wall Street, they stole our money. You know what? Let them keep them. Keep it. Let them have it. Because it's not really real money. It's all an accounting system. We can all agree to ourselves that from now on, all that money on Wall Street, we're not accepting it. We're not accepting this kind of money. You got a $100 bill? Congratulations. It looks pretty. Keep it. Save it in a piece of plastic. It's a historical document. But if you want my food, I'm only going to accept Monopoly money. Or we're only going to accept our own different kind of money that you and I agree. Let them keep all the money that they stole from us. Congratulations. We're going to create our own money. You want my food? I'm going to accept transition dollars. I'm going to accept monopoly money. I'm going to accept some different kind of money that you and I agree. We're the ones who did the work. We're the ones who are exchanging goods and services. They're the ones who are trying to steal our money. Let them have it. They can have it. We're going to create a whole new monetary system. This has happened many times in the past. So one of the most amazing currencies lasted for over 700 years in England. Uh, King Henry was aware that in the 700s that there was not enough money. There wasn't enough gold and silver coins, there wasn't enough, uh, they created market money on market days, but he decided that all the large transactions and the entire administration of uh, the kingdom should be done with a currency that was basically accounting that he would issue. So whenever the king wanted to accomplish something, he would issue a talent stick in order to accomplish that. And talent stick is a stick of wood. And it's not, it's polished, and it's engraved, but it's notched. And the size of the notch is the amount of money. So a thousand pounds is like that, and a one pound is a little sauce So once you've made the talus stick for the certain amount, then you split it down the middle. And the king keeps the one half and spends the other half into the economy, where it can circulate, and it's worth this much. When it comes back to the king, in payment of taxes, and you have to pay your taxes with tally sticks. When it comes back to the king in payment of taxes, it gets matched up with the other half and burned. Why did they need to split it? So you can't counterfeit it. If there's any doubt, then you can bring it back to the king and check it out. Uh, the penalty, of course, for counterfeiting a tally stick is off with your head. So there was very little counterfeiting, but we could always tell whether somebody was counterfeiting because it wouldn't fit. Anyway, for 700 years, that was the currency of England. And uh, the money changers, uh, who become the bankers, they wanted to get back to gold, because they control the gold, and if they control the gold, then they can control the whole economy. They can control the whole country. So um, they demanded payment in gold. And during the uh, early 1600s, late 1500s, this was a raging controversy. Could you make a contract in which you had to be, you lent gold and you had to be paid back in gold? It went through the courts, uh, such as they were in those days. And it went back and forth and it got appealed and appealed and appealed until finally the House of Lords had to decide. It's called the Mixed Monies Case. The contract was for payment in gold. The payment was made with a tally stick. Is this legitimate? The House of Lords made the most profound, absolutely clear statement that absolutely everybody has to know. Money is whatever the king says it is. When we had the American Revolution, uh, Tom Paine pointed out that the American Revolution was won before it began because it was won in the hearts of the people. We came to understand that we were passing the sovereignty from the king to ourselves. We were all going to be sovereign. The important thing was that once the people are sovereign, 
then issuing the money, which is a sovereign prerogative, money is whatever the sovereign says it is, whatever the sovereign provides to the people as the means of exchange, um, when the people are sovereign, then we can have, let's call it organic money. We can issue the money as we need it to affect the transactions that we want to make. Money does not ever, ever, ever need to be scarce or hard to come by. However, Unless it's legal tender, that is, you have to accept it, the issue is how easily can you spend it. You can only spend the money that you create together among people who agree to accept it. And therefore, organic money would be based on that understanding. If we accept this as the means of exchange using the dollars and cents, using the unit of value that we're all familiar with, if we could just agree to accept this organic money in payment, money would never have to be scarce. And the question, where are you going to get the money, doesn't arise. The question is, what do you want to do? And is there a demand for it? As soon as we sit down together, and look at each other and say, what do we want? And know that we are sovereign and we can issue the money for it? Everything changes. So organic money will overcome the negative determining power of our monetary system. Organic money will return the issuing power to the people where it rightfully belongs. Yeah, I think we decided. There's no decisions that we actually made in Yeah, that's black. not on the list either, is that it would be, or maybe it no, is. No, it is. You, you actually yeah. emailed it out. It, our bills yeah. will be Let the same yeah. size as U.S. dollars. Okay. Yes. Okay. And in the same denomination. We'll keep it All right, so some of the different names that we're voting on in terms of what would be our local alternative currency here for Transition Putney are either community currency or Putney community currency, energy units, Trade Dollars or Putney Trade Dollars, Putney Promise, Putney Powers, Putney Rubbles, Putney Metabucks, Putney Investment Notes, Putney BTUs, Putney Energy Credits, Transition Notes, and NYT, Not There Yet Notes. Anyone object to words around the edge? Because I had a lot of fun with that. No, that was nice. Not at all. That's good. That, the can more also, that can also be somewhat of a, depending on the printing method, uh -huh. this, the tiny print around the edges could be an added security feature because depending on the printing like process, it's harder if you try to do a laser copy and then mm. print it. So mm. I don't know how sophisticated right. we're mm. going to get, but... I like that idea. And, and, and money is a symbol. So because money is a symbol, you want to use a lot of words to convey what are the symbols, mm -hmm. what are our value, what's our value our system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our values, yeah. That's great. I did spend a lot of time playing with this design. But I think it's a little too complicated, and there's there are elements in there that are indecipherable. So I think it needs to be simplified a little bit. That's true in this one too, though. Sure. You know, yeah, unless you're really a money buff mm -hmm. and you get into deciphering the various bits and pieces. Well, it's more true with this one. I it mean, does kind of just, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot in there. You can see there's a lot in there, and you don't necessarily know what everything in there. Yeah, but is. if you look at this, there's like the chevron symbols, sure. and there's like you know opium poppies and machine guns. I mean, it's like you know they took this, they yeah, really they went to it. town yeah, and yeah, played yeah. with it. Yeah, and there's the it's trade, fun there's if you're the trade into towers, it. and you know, and if, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who did that one? It's not necessary. Uh, there's a whole group of people that does the fraudulent event notes that are. Isn't there yeah. something sort like of a camel coming around the pyramid? <laughs> something like that. Well, yeah, it's on here. It's all kinds of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's the pyramids. The lights on in the White House window or something like this that. This is uh, <laughs> this is like the um, totalitarian information no, I mean, awareness. You know that. Did you, that this has been introduced, and it's actually House they're discussing it you know, now. Vermont House of Representatives, they're discussing it. I can read it to you if you want. Only three pages. Uh, all right. I think it's pretty cool. Introduced by Representative Fisher of Lincoln County. Uh, subject, commerce and trade, companion currency, Vermont dollars. But in a nutshell, it essentially, uh, it's a bill that seeks to authorize a nonprofit corporation to print local currency for the state of Vermont. The whole state. Uh, what's interesting about this, though, is that it actually um, 
empowers the government of Vermont to tell a company, a nonprofit, to do this. So it sort of sets up, you know, sort of a, a structure. We were thinking if the U.S. dollar tanks, we'd want to be able to not tank with it. Yeah. So yeah. anyone who's holding Vermont dollar or Putney dollars or whatever right. uh, would would be in a better position, you know, especially in the local economy if the U.S. dollar suddenly dives. Right. It's, it's been my goal to create a local currency that is multi-layered multi in the sense that one layer or one function of it is just a local currency that circulates mm -hmm. and creates value within the community by not leaving the community. Okay. The second goal is to use it as some sort of leverage device to help us create and implement renewable energy projects, hence the name renewable energy currency, so that either it is an investment vehicle or it is somehow a reward for investing in green energy. And we haven't figured out the details of any of that. Hello. So when I am not being a legislator, I am a social worker. And um, this is my office. So you understand quite deeply the problems of of oh, not enough money. The bill is H361. Uh, H361 is called the, the Vermont Dollars Bill. And um, what it uh, seeks to do really is to um, explore the possibility of us creating uh, a local currency, if you will, uh, local being the state of Vermont, uh, um, to supplement uh, U.S. currency. When I started to look at uh, sort of what it costs us to get a dollar bill, uh, what it costs the state to borrow money, or, what it, or who makes money uh, when a dollar bill is put into circulation, um, I just, you know, Wall Street, the central bank makes money. Every dollar that's put into circulation, the central bank um, does well. <laughs> and. Um, uh, as I have talked to people about the legality, uh, become convinced that there is a mechanism for us to uh, create a local currency. And um, the upsides is if we could create a local currency that had value to Vermonters, it would uh, be a Vermont only currency. It wouldn't be uh, uh, an exchange of goods or services that would have any value to somebody across the Vermont, across the border, and uh, and that would focus its positive here in Vermont. Although these two two-dollar bills look virtually identical, there is a very very significant difference. The top bill, if you look up here says Federal Reserve note. It's issued out of debt at interest. This bottom note says Federal note. It was issued by the government, debt and interest free. There's no bond owing on this. There's no interest on a bond owing on this. And it makes a massive difference. It would have saved our country roughly $800 billion last year in interest on the 14 or so trillion dollar debt. The money represents the valuable goods and services. Money makes them commensurate so that we can exchange them. It's the goods and services that are valuable and not the money itself. So we're here at the Brattleboro Time and Trades Potluck, monthly potluck. Uh, my name is Dan Ridgeway. I'm a board member on the Brattleboro Time and Trade and one of the um, early members from the early days of the Brattleboro Time and Trade. We have a really good turnout tonight with some really fantastic food that lots of folks have brought. And uh, there's just lots of networking and connections being made here uh, amongst many different members of the Time Bank. And uh, I hear a lot of chatter about different exchanges and services going on, which is really exciting to see happen. And 
it'll be farming, so I probably will offer food with that cooking. Um, and some light bookkeeping. Um, but I'm excited to get haircuts and um, acupuncture. I make apple pies. Can offer, um, you know, small carpentry building. So I'm offering piano lessons to children. Um, I'm not working my way up to adults. <laughs> I just wanted to take a minute to talk about how time banks work and what the purpose of a time bank is. Uh, we're bringing it back down to the community level, to a grassroots level, and we're just basically bartering on the most fundamental level. By earning hours uh, instead of dollars to spend on services, you are redefining work. It reinforces that everybody, regardless of their economic status, their social status, their class, their education level, um, they have something to offer that's of value to other people. What we're gonna we're gonna do a little simulation game that we've been developing. So what you are are your merchants in a trading circle, your merchants at the market, your merchants in the local economy. Really, what you are is the merchants in a local economy. Your tradespeople. I'm selling cooking utensils. Cooking utensils. <laughs> and you have fine art prints. Fine art. And I have a very miscellaneous assortment of things. <laughs> you look like a drugstore. Yeah, well, you're, you're a dollar store is what you are. <laughs> I have pot holders. Beach balls. Books. Lighting. Lighting store. We have 27 items. How much money do we need in circulation so that we can potentially exchange all of these items? It's nine because there are nine players. Okay. All right. Um, you said it's worth a buck, right? Everything's mm -hmm. worth a buck. We all have three and there's nine of us. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's so hopefully seven. each one of those dollars would go to each merchant. That's, okay. that's the uh, all right. place. Well, I, I'm somebody from outside <laughs> okay. this little economy. This is a little economy we have here, right? And I'm going to buy that football. Okay, so when... Karen, can I have one of your... Um... Once you sell something, okay. you immediately... Oh, I do you want this You one? immediately okay. buy something once okay. you sell something. Oh, I want that scraper. A band-aid, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, I like those socks. Thanks. I like the strainer spoon. <laughs> That's how the BU, B, uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. Thank you. <laughs> I would love a candle. Oh, thank you. And I would really love one of those beach balls. <laughs> Argyle socks. So I'm from China and I'd love to sell you this cup. They're really nice. They're uh, well made, they're cheap, they're uh, just cooperating place. Outsiders coming Okay. Now what? So what happened? Oh, our money's gone. Very we simple. have no money. Anybody? Where did it go? It's been and, now, and now the trading stopped. It's been usurped. What we normally call money is in reality currency, the stuff we carry in our wallets. What real money is, is the flow of value. Well, I think that this spot is just a, it's a place of trying to make a decision of whether to do the next song or not the next song. Um, right in this spot earlier this day, I had my eyes closed, and I, I just want to tell you, I got duck. I, I, I was going to be a duck, you know, and I, I was like, and that, that was the impulse, you know, and, and it was what I really was, and, and, and then all of a sudden I thought, well, because that's what I first thought, why don't I try a whole new life? Why don't I become a cow? And so I thought, I'll, I'll be the cow instead of the duck. And then immediately, I, I started asking, like, why did I make that decision? I felt like there were the, these guys with hands looking over, <laughs> trying to decide whether it should, should the women be voted for. And then I tried to decide, to think if, if, if it should be me or if it should be a group. And it was like having all, all this problem. I was like, no, no, I'm going to stick to the cow.
<laughs> I felt, I felt the cow, you know, like maybe because I, I, I felt duck so fast that everyone is going to be a duck and I have to stand with the solidarity of the minority. <laughs> and then I thought, well, the cows are bigger than the ducks. Maybe the ducks, I don't know, the, the, the cow, the cow, cow, cow. And so I started going, I go, mmm, I land on it, I go, mmm. And I swear to you, I don't hear another mmm in the whole room. It's just filled with quack, 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 quack. <laughs> and I'm feeling like, like, I feel like I'm this little, little calf coming out and I can't even stand up, you know, and I'm like, where is my mama? You know, where's my mama? And I, I'm thinking, like, I need that big, like, little, little milk thing, tit thing. <laughs> and then I think, well, isn't that, isn't that kind of like what the, what the banks are, you know? Like, like, you come, you get some money, you're like, oh, I got some money. And then you look around, and you're like, why did I get it? What, what am I, what am I doing, what am I going to do here? I know, I know I want to be here, but why do I want to be here? You know, like, and, and, and then where's the bank? You know, where's the, where's the bank? It's my mother. It's out of my mother. You know? We are going to be birthing a new humanity. We are birthing a humanity that's going to be conscious, that's going to embody all of our values, loving, compassionate, generous, authentic. We are giving birth to a new humanity, so we are actually the global midwives and global mid-husbands of a new humanity. So the common good economy is a revolution with a bank. The common good economy movement started with noticing that the, the people who control the wealth and power in the world are making a mess of things. Our current economic system is not working for the planet, it's not working for most people. What we really need is a way for people in individual communities to get together and plan together what we need to do in our communities to, to make sure that everybody gets enough to eat, to make sure everybody has a home, uh, satisfying work, health care, and a sustainable environment. And we need a way of funding those plans. What we've designed is a way for people to do that and it's based on having a bank to fund our plans and being able to decide the lending priorities for that bank and decide how the profits are distributed for the common good. Over the past nine years uh, thousands of people around the world have gotten excited about this, mostly in the United States, and we've put together a team of, of people who are working actively to um, to raise money to fund the startup of Common Good Bank and, uh, and thereby the start of this common good economy system. This is a financial institution that we will all own together with the spirit of the credit union and the power of a stock savings bank so that we can all make decisions in our communities uh, having the power of that bank behind us to fund those decisions. This is big. This is a game changer. This is something that can change our lives in every community around the world so that we can decide together what businesses we need to make our community sustainable, what work we need to do to get everybody fed, everybody housed, everybody productively employed, give everybody health care. And we have the funding to put people to work, to do the work that needs to be done. So how do we know that this Common Good Bank is going to be any better than the other ones? How do we know that it, it isn't going to do the same bad stuff that the big banks are doing nowadays? Well, that's easy. This is a bank that we own. It's not just a small group of people who are in it for the money. It's all of us in it together for our own benefit. Do you have a proposal that's similar to the North Dakota Public Bank? Actually, I'm sponsoring two proposals, and one uh, by myself and the other with other senators. And the, the one proposal on a state bank, which would be um, similar to or like the North Dakota uh, State Bank. The other proposal is specifically for a green bank, which is focused more on energy or environmental investment. I see, I see benefits to both of those. I think there are risks associated and benefits associated with, with both of those. Um, so I look forward to the conversation. I know we're headed in the right direction. Yeah, it's a logical extension, really, when you talk about ways to keep dollars in Vermont, to look more closely at the idea of a Vermont State Bank. You know, right now, the thing is, the state of Vermont collects taxes and deposits our money in banks 
A lot of those banks are clearly not in Vermont. They're big Wall Street banks. They use our money to make money for themselves. They charge us fees to, to work with our money. They, they provide us with low interest rates for the money we deposit in their banks. What we're thinking about is a Vermont State Bank that would be the place where the state of Vermont would deposit our tax dollars. Then we would be able to direct those tax dollars towards the kind of lending that we want to see happen, whether it's student loans or agriculture or small business here in the state of Vermont. The other advantages, though, are that the state bank would charge the state of Vermont lower fees for the work that it does, and if necessary, provide also higher interest rate for our tax dollars that are deposited there. So at the end of the year, there would be some profit that would normally, if it was a private, commercial, multinational bank, they would pocket those fees. In this case, what would happen is, I'm sorry, pocket those profits. In this case, what would happen is those profits would come back to the state of Vermont. I'll give you an example, North Dakota has a state bank, and there are some differences between North Dakota and Vermont, but they have a state bank, and it goes through the process that I described of handling the state's money. At the end of the year, the North Dakota State Bank actually gives the state of North Dakota, on average, about $40 million a year goes back to the state. Now, that's money that if they... If it was all deposited in, you know, the Bank of America or some multinational bank, they would pocket that as profit. But a state bank would not need to pocket any profit, so they would actually return that profit back to the people of the state of Vermont so we can fund needed programs. Also, I think people need to understand that we're not talking about building a bank where it would be on the corner of state and Maine and you'd go down and open a checking account or, or a savings account or a Christmas club. This is really a banker's bank, so it's not one that would be used by individuals. It would actually do the work though, to make sure that the state's money is uh, invested properly and lent properly. The other important thing about it is the state bank would support the efforts of local community banks in their lending. Often the smaller banks have to rely on larger multinational banks to back them on certain loans. and. Um, security arrangements. In this case, the state bank would support the local community banks. We would, they would not be involved with the larger, you know, multinational banks. So it would support local Vermont community-based banks. It would return money back to the state of Vermont, and it would allow us to better direct the money that we do have towards the kind of lending policies that we want to see. Again, whether it's supporting more student loans or loans for agriculture or small business. So again. It gives us an ability to keep more of our dollars here in the state of Vermont and invest them more in the local economy. Thank you, North Dakota. This is James. Can I help you? Hi, James. My name is uh, Jason Root. Um, I have a couple questions about your bank, and um, I understand that your state is the only state during this recession that during this recession that has had uh, job and income growth. Is that correct? Um, I could not confirm that as to the other states. I think that is kind of knowledge on the street, so to speak, or in reports that the state of North Dakota has kind of been unique in this economic times as to having job growth and having a surplus budget and, and being in good standing. Can you um, briefly describe uh, how your bank is different than other banks? Uh, so, you know, we are not a normal retail bank in that sense. We do not have branches or locations across the state. We have one location. We're a state agency. And uh, so, you know, that, that, that in a nutshell is, you know, we're about providing economic development opportunities and loan programs that we might devise or that the legislature, which is currently in session, might come up with and, you know, mandate that we go out there and, you know, put these programs into place in order to, you know, offer better services for the residents of North Dakota. All right, well, um, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And okay, uh, call me back or you can go out to your website and find uh, extensive uh, information out there on the bank. All right, thanks. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Okay. Thank you. Looks like Vermont. It looks like Vermont, my little studio here. All right, I'm ready. All right. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I'm making this film. Uh, it's almost done. It's called Organic Money. And mm -hmm. the, the idea being, how can we create good money for the good of all? And you've been a pioneer in this uh, field. 
about how we can restructure our monetary system so we, uh, we change who is creating the credit for the benefit of everyone. Um, would you describe where you're at with uh, public banking? Well, we now have an institute, the Public Banking Institute, and we have uh, quite a few coordinators in different states, and 14 states have bills pending for state-owned banks, um, with California one of the last to join, which we're quite excited about because I'm in California, and uh, we have a, m a number of labor unions that are supporting this. The bill has uh, made it, it breezed through three committees and is through the um, assembly and it is now going to the Senate where they're it's in search of a committee in the Senate. So we're hoping something will happen before July. It's only a bill for a feasibility study, but still that will give a lot of visibility to the issue and we can um, present a lot of material to the to the state. Um, it's it seems like a no brainer to us, but the problem is that most people don't understand it. And so their first reaction is going to be I don't trust government, why do we need another bank? But what they don't understand and what our job is, is to clarify how banking actually works and that by the state, which has a huge fund of assets and a huge deposit base, potential deposit base and asset base, is our state of California is putting all that money in Wall Street. And then Wall Street is using that as the basis for leverage to um, leverage much more money in the form of credit, which they are using for their own purposes. If they were lending it back to us, then fine, but they're not. They're not making small business loans. They're, I mean, they've cut way back. They're forcing local businesses to, to um, fund their businesses on credit cards, which is like 18% interest after if you go over a month, which is what they typically do because the way businesses work, they have to pay their workers and materials before they can um, have a product to sell to pay back the loan. So it used to be that they had these cheap credit lines with their local banks. Now all the local banks are getting taken over by the big Wall Street banks and the Wall Street banks are cutting the credit lines and replacing them with very expensive credit cards. So that's just one thing. The small banks are floundering. The big, the big five Wall Street banks get all the perks. They were bailed out by the government and therefore they have better credit ratings because everybody thinks that the government is standing behind them. They, they can't fail. They can get very cheap money from the government and or from the Federal Reserve or from, and from the other banks. They can borrow from each other at 0.2%, the Fed funds rate, and then they use that money not to make loans to small businesses or to homeowners, but to speculate. Most of their profits now are coming from trading. So the, the big banks are doing fine, but the reason is that they're trading, which means speculating. They're um, buying and selling for their own accounts in in the stock market and whatever, speculating in derivatives. They're the big derivatives holders. So that's something we want. Not only do we not want to support that, but we want to get our money back from there so that we can use those same tools but for the public interest in other words if we took our own profits and our i mean i'm sorry our own deposits back and our own assets back that we the state then we could do the same thing set up our own bank and leverage that money into many times that many times our asset base in uh, credit and then we can use that credit for public purposes what the the one model is the bank of north dakota uh, it's the one state-owned bank in the country. North Dakota is the only state that has is sporting it, its biggest ever surplus. Most of the states are teetering on bankruptcy. Um, North Dakota has the lowest default rate in the country, and it has the most local banks per capita, or the most banks per capita, which means the Bank of North Dakota has helped the little banks. It's not competing with them. It makes a point of not competing. What it does is it partners with the little banks and um, provides the capital, provides the guarantees so they can make loans. For here in California, for example, if if you want to raise money, you have to get approval from the voters. You have to go out and raise a bond issue. It takes a long time. You don't know if you're going to get approval. For this reason, they have to keep these huge rainy day funds, which are a waste of assets. And they're invested in Wall Street. and get They're giving that leverage and power to Wall Street. 
So in North Dakota, they had the government, the state government and the local governments have a credit line with the Bank of North Dakota. So they want money, they just go to the bank and get the money. I mean, they still have to pay that back. So they have to raise the money and they do do a bond issue eventually, but they can take their time with it. They've got, it's like a business, you know, they've now got this credit line and so they can just proceed with what they want to do. William, from your first initial plan to have a common good bank, uh, how is this um, uh, transformed into the R credit system? Okay, our plan right along has been to establish a chartered financial institution and a local money system and to have the two of those working together seamlessly so that you can treat those two balances, your, your local money balance and your U.S. dollar balance, as a single pool of money and write a check against it or use a credit card or an ATM machine uh, to get the money out. And that's still our plan, but instead of focusing on starting the bank, we're focusing on starting the local money system, the R credits system. And uh, in the meantime, we have a partnership with E3 Bank, a socially responsible bank startup in Philadelphia, to, um, to work together to design common good accounts which is um, the purpose of the original Common Good Bank plan. We're focusing on the R credit system now uh, because it's faster. It's a faster way to get to where we want to go. Uh, starting a bank is really a lot of, of work and a lot of negotiation and a lot of money. You have to raise, um, we were looking to raise $11.5 million. To start the R credit system, we only need to raise about a quarter of a million dollars uh, to fund the software development, and we're already well along in that goal. That with the R credit system, any community anywhere can issue money just like the Federal Reserve, except local, democratic, and for the public good rather than for private profit. How can we create money? How can we uh, issue money uh, and have it be worth something? And that's the, the most common question we get with this. Um, and I think what we need to do is to look at something that we all understand first, which is a coupon, uh, just as a, as a place to start. Is if you're in business, you can issue uh, coupons. You can print up as many coupons as you like and hand them out, as many as you like, to anyone you want to hand them out to. And then customers can come and spend those at your store just like money. Um, and it's your promise to accept that coupon that gives it its value. It's your promise that makes it act like money at your store. If you get together with a bunch of other businesses and you all make this promise together that you will all accept these coupons as payment for your goods and services, then it starts to act much more like money because then uh, customers can spend it at any of these stores. Um, and when you receive one of these as payment, you can then spend it at one of the other participating businesses and the money circulates, it goes around in the community just like official currency does. This is the way you would buy something with, uh, with the R credit system. You take your card into a store and when you go to the checkout line, the cashier would have a cell phone or a computer connected to the internet. And if it's a cell phone, uh, they could either um, send a standard text message saying charge so-and-so, your member number, a certain amount, uh, press send, and they get a message back that says, did you really want to charge Kathy this much? And they say yes, and then they get a, a transaction number confirming that the transaction happened. Uh, but even more simply for uh, stores, so they can use a smartphone and scan your QR code. Mm -hmm. On your, on your card and then just type in the number and then they're done. They get a confirmation back for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so very quick and easy at uh, 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 a store that has that set up. Uh, it's about uh, equivalent to processing a credit card except that it doesn't have any of the overhead. In fact, the store, instead of having to pay a fee for processing it, they get paid for processing mm -hmm. it And where would I way. get my, my um, initial amount of R credits? When you sign up and when you are permitted to be active in the system, uh, the system puts a certain amount of R credits in your account right from the beginning. And I don't have to pay anything? No, there's no cost to join. 
our economy is going through some very big and fundamental changes. What we're looking at is the idea of a Vermont credit card that would, every time it was used, it would put some money aside that would go into a fund to support Vermont-based causes, particularly renewable energy and local agriculture. Now, it wouldn't be a card that just Vermonters would carry. It would also be a card for people from outside Vermont who talk about how much they love Vermont or like to visit Vermont could also carry the Vermont credit card. We'd be able to charge more reasonable rates of interest on the card, for one thing. But the more important thing is that the dollars would stay in the state of Vermont. And every time you use the card, some money would be set aside into a fund to support local economic development. You know, it's interesting because there's a lot of support for the concept of a state credit card. A lot of people say that they would like to carry one. Um, but as many with many things that go on, when you start talking about new economic ideas, there are resistance from people in power. There's not a bill to do a Vermont credit card because, on the one hand, the bill might be a way to push the point, and if something doesn't happen soon, I think we will introduce a bill. But like a lot of good ideas, you shouldn't need a piece of legislation to make this happen. What you really need is to have the governor or the administration, members of state government, sit down with a couple of Vermont-based banks and make it happen. Okay, so we're talking about today, a lot of people feel like Wall Street has ripped off America. We feel like they've stolen our money. And how did that happen? Did they steal our money? Well, didn't we freely deposit our money into their account? Yeah, we did. You know why? Because they said, look, trust us. Put your money in our bank account and it'll be safe. It's FDIC insured. Your money is safe with us. Trust us. Because in the olden days, it used to be just like, okay, I'll give you some food now. I'll trust you to pay me back later. Because I know you and it's a small town. Everybody knows each other. Society is so big now. We have to set up these institutions that are based on trust. So I put my dollar in the bank, I trust it's there when I need it. Oh my god, I had no idea that the bank is taking my one dollar and lending ten dollars to somebody else. And they're saying to the other person, trust us, here's ten dollars. Trust us. We trusted them. They deceived us. So we don't have to trust them anymore. That's our choice. We can trust in each other. We can trust in God. We don't have to trust in the banksters. If someone trusts us something that takes a long time to earn, and it takes a second to lose it. So, since 1913, when the Federal Reserve System has been established, the banksters, the Federal Reserve Banking System, has been earning our trust, perhaps. But now, recently, they've showed us that they've been deceiving us. Congress gave, Congress has the authority to coin money, because we the people, we elect our congressmen, they represent us, so we trust them because we voted for them. They're the ones who have the authority to make money as mentioned in the Constitution. Now Congress has kind of subcontracted that role out to the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank doesn't represent us. They represent the rich, ruling class, my, minuscule, tiny elite. A tiny, tiny percent of the population kind of controls much of the wealth. I didn't vote on that. You didn't vote on that. We voted on our congressmen to represent us. Uh, would you speak about uh, what your perspective is on the Federal Reserve? Is it a useful entity? Is it an entity that is constitutional? Is it our problem? Um, well, it's the problem is that it's been there since 1913, so it would pr be pretty hard to overthrow it on constitutional grounds. But I would certainly argue that in the Constitution where it says Congress shall have the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof, that means create money. Because they, they never talked about paper money at all. And certainly they didn't talk about credit cards and all the forms of money that we use today. Most money today is not paper or coins. It's um, digital. And that's not in the Constitution at all. But I would say that the, under the, that Implied Powers Act, that it's implied that Congress would be issuing our money, not some private entity. Now, Congress arguably had the power to delegate to a private entity, and that's what they did by passing the Federal Reserve Act. 
but we certainly we the people certainly have no control over what the federal reserve does and the whole point of the constitution was to make sure that we had the power to create our own money i i would argue that and uh william jennings bryan was led the opposition to the federal reserve act and he said there was no way that he was going to approve he, he was leader of the populace they were certainly not well he was a democrat but anyway he led the populist movement and he said they were not going to approve any act which gave the power to print the nation's currency to a private banking cartel which would then lend the money back to us at interest and the act was so obscurely worded that he thought he got what he wanted they changed the name of it and they made it look like the government would be issuing the money so so he actually was highly approving of it he said at last the government will be issuing the money this is what we wanted all along and that's not what it was at all Relaxing here in my home with my beautiful family, who are less than nothing less than beautiful, who I hold in the vastness of my heart. <laughs> All right. I want to hear about your proposal and um, how it affects our existing monetary system. Okay. And first, I guess we need to introduce you. you oh, David Sneakers. David, yes. David Sneakers, if, uh, if the funny way of saying that if you can't get any. Uh, <laughs> Tell me how Margaret, to say Margaret, it. Uh, uh, the easy way to, to remember it is if you can't get any tickets to my cooking class, Dave will sneak us in. Because yeah. <laughs> you're a macrobiotic. A macrobiotic counselor and chef. Yeah. And coach. Okay. So, how did you get interested in money? Oh, I got interested in money uh, a few years after 9 11 when I found out that a third building went down about four or five years ago, and I read the paper uh, fairly well, I think, because I thought it was a, a, a person I'd known about the news, but I never heard that building, uh, the third building number seven went down on 9-11. On so I said, something's wrong here, and I tried to figure out what it was, in my opinion, in my own uh, research, my own um, uh, abilities from the past in analyzing the news and what's true and not true, and knowing for myself what I felt was important. So I researched, and I said, I'll follow the money. And I followed the money to find out that these things are happening for the benefit of the monetary system, the usury monetary system, which one word I came to conclusion was usury. Usury, the unsustainable use of, uh, of interest. It's un any, any amount of interest on money is unsustainable into the future. In the beginning, it looks easy and payable, but when you borrow money from the bank, you have to pay interest. The principal is created by the borrowing uh, signature promise to pay, but the interest is not created. So when many of us borrow money from the bank, the interest is not created so where does that money come from? Someone has to foreclose and, or someone has to go bankrupt. It's inevitable. That's the unsustainability that I'm talking about. And everybody else has to compete like... And everybody has to else compete and or steal or uh, connive or, or uh, compete uh, in, a, in a monetary system that should not, uh, that, that shouldn't be. You, should, uh, you and I sh and anyone else can exchange our services for someone else's equal time and services. Um, and it's not, uh, uh, it, it might not, it's not a, uh, 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 honest system that we're living in. It's a corrupt, deceptive system. So everybody's trying to cheat everybody else. Everybody's bribing everybody else. Everybody's stealing the resources of the earth and, uh, giving people low paying jobs and not, uh, not, not productive in a, in a sense of keeping the earth alive and well and, 
and uh, environmentally uh, clean and mentally sane. <laughs> I think there's an insanity with our current monetary system. So what is your vision of hope? And how do we amend the system so that we can have hope for hmm. our future? Right. One, one of the ways is through a public bank. And that is where we, the people, put the money in the bank through our either taxes or investments or, I mean, our deposits. And the bank, you, the, the people in the bank, because banks are a necessary part of our society today. And without them, the, the economy basically, quote unquote, might, uh, might collapse in that certain, that large sense. But if we can use the money uh, from, uh, Th that we have to pay in, currently pay in an interest. For example, in Massachusetts, the debt service is $2.4 billion. $2.4 billion. In other words, the interest that, that interest Massachusetts is paying on money that they borrowed from other banks. It's principal and interest, so it's called mm -hmm. debt service. So yeah. principal interest amounts to $2.4 billion. And you can find that in the CAFR report of 2010, page 50. And that is uh, paid to private banks, to Wall Street, to money that goes outside of the current monetary system that could be created in Massachusetts alone. So Massachusetts would create its own bank. It would, would buy the debt, which is $24 billion, okay, and not have to pay the $2 billion annually every year in debt service. And the budget gap just happens to be $1.5 billion. So I put the two together, and I end up with a half a billion dollars to we actually create a bank and get everything ready for the, the economy, in which the uh, bank would le be lending money to those things that don't necessarily always bring in the, r the quick money. When banks lend money today, you have to have assets. You have to have collateral. You have to have a lot of credit credibility. That's why they lend money, because for those who have credit, they can pay back two and a half times the loan. Uh, so that, if that people have the stamina and the ability to do that, that's great. And they can keep their money just as we have public bank, uh, private schools and public schools. We have where you can buy books online or you can go to the public library and borrow a book. Same thing with banks. We have private banks and then we can have public banks for, for the people to use. So you've introduced a bill? In I've Massachusetts? introduced a bill, it's called 1192, House Bill 1192, in which I offer what I believe is the greatest value and greatest benefit to the state of Massachusetts, which is a Massachusetts State Bank. Why? It varies, as I said before, to stop the $2.4 billion in debt service that we're paying, okay, and then it's uh, instead invest in Massachusetts jobs and services that are currently being cut, no more budget cuts. We would have a problem of surplus <laughs> if we had a Massachusetts State Bank. Wouldn't that be interesting? The Federal Reserve is a consortium of private, for-profit banks which form the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve issues all its money as debt. Can you describe the, the harm that a debt-based monetary system does to our society? Uh, it, it does harm it on multiple levels, but if you just take the most uh, basic thing that people are interested in is probably getting a home to live in. If you go and buy a home for $200,000, which is the lower end of what a home goes for in this area, if you get a 30-year mortgage at a relatively low interest rate of 5%, you're going to have to pay $300,000 in interest on your $200,000 house over 30 years, which means, yes, you bought a house, but you bought the bank a house and a half. This is not right. It's not fair. The bank doesn't deserve a house and a half for them creating money to give to you. And until we have an economic system that's democratic, we cannot have a democracy because how money is spent is how actions are directed. If money is made available for war, we have war. If money is not made available for green energy, organic food, 
uh, education, music programs, things like that, then we don't have money for those things that we as a community probably deem as more important than defense or war. I want to introduce a new concept many people have not heard about recently. It's called the gift economy. You can trace it back to when humans lived in tribes. The way it worked was, I'm a farmer, he's a hunter, this person takes care of the children, this person makes our clothes. So what happens is, this person gives me clothing, this person gives me the free gift of daycare. We're all just giving things freely to each other. That can happen. It's fair. It's called sharing the natural abundance that we have that came from God, Mother Nature, the universe. It was here before we are. So that's another thing to think about. Instead of selling things, just give things to people you know. When you give something to someone, it creates a sense of a social obligation. In terms of our understanding of, of, of money and economics at this point in time in, in, in history of man, which is, we're in a really dark period here, in that, uh, you know, we have wars over money, the money is, is speculated upon. It has no connection to reality in many respects. Um, and that's why I, I came here to talk about seeds, be it an apple seed, be it chickpeas in a, in a jar, um, uh, be it a almost all, all eaten bag of peanuts. And that the seed is a natural form of currency. Here I have a, a jar of seeds, a jar of chickpeas. They're in a bank of sorts. They're in the bank. They, they've, been, they've been put in, a, in, a, in, in something to protect it from the elements. Just as a peanut is in a seed to protect it from the elements, and it wants you to crack open the safe and, and eat it. With this, I have to crack open the safe and it's pretty easy, I just turn it, and here it is, it's open. The seeds are open, open sesame, and we have access to a something that has real intrinsic value. In fact, all of our value still on the planet is based on seeds. It's based on food. It's based on something that's connected to li something living, something that has lived something that actually has the potential for life and to give life and to continue life. So that's, when we talk about value, that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're talking about. We hear about biting the apple, the forbidden fruit, but we don't hear about the seed much. But we do know about Johnny Appleseed and uh, what he did going across the country and planting seeds. I think there were a lot of Johnny Appleseeds in, uh, spreading the bounty that people would find later. And uh, there are people that are doing that already, once again. And they're, they're planting fruit trees in a, in a commons so that people can come and just pick an apple. Who owns it? Well, it's really nature. Hello, I'm Emily Payton. Thank you for watching this film. Thank you everyone who helped me make the film. And I would like to add that I called it Organic Money because I hope to take the mystery out of how we can create a better monetary system. And by using the term organic, I want to bring it down to earth and also to imply that there is a healthy way to use the monetary system. When we have enough money coming into circulation that is created free of the toxins of addiction and gambling and selfishness, then we'll have the methods to restore a harmony on this planet and to create a greater planetary healing. So there's no more important understanding to share than this. It's our job, I believe, to look at the work ahead as healing work. 
to restore the capacity for compassion in the hearts of those where it has shrunken and shriveled. And to see human compassion grow stronger and the experiences of sacred enjoyment of life shared by more across the planet, more living things across the planet, I believe is a goal of mothers everywhere. We'll need organic money, so to speak, for those goals to be met. So I thank you once again. Bye-bye for now. This is Mary, Queen of Scots. She's very special. She and I were discussing the other day about organic money, and she and I both agree it's the way to go.